Hi everyone, welcome to Sunday morning here at First Baptist Church in Berlin, New York. And uh, I'm always excited to be able to have the opportunity to share the Word of God with you. It indeed is a, a great privilege to do that, and I'm very, very happy that you've joined us today. We are in a series of messages about vision. Today I'm going to talk about Vision Unleashed as we uh, refer to the book of uh, Nehemiah, as we have been in the last several weeks. Opening scripture that is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. God's word says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Exciting promise and reminder from God today. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer together as we begin our time. Father, we thank you for your word. And I don't know what individual needs are represented here today, but I know that we often come before you with heavy hearts and uh, maybe are struggling with different areas in our lives. And yet we know that you have the answers we need. And I pray that you would open our eyes to what we need from your word today. Bless each one that uh, is watching this uh, video. I pray, Lord, you'd encourage them and strengthen them. Pray for your blessings upon your word. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the past several weeks, we have been uh, talking about vision. And, and the idea of vision, the definition we're using here, is uh, it's a God-given desire to uh, do something that will bring great glory to God. Not just our own plan, not just a, a vision in the sense of having uh, a great idea to further our, um, our job opportunities, whatever. I mean, those can, those can be good, but we're talking about a vision, a God-given vision that doing something for God. And here's, here's what we need to understand. A vision from God will stretch our faith. It's not very comfortable sometimes because it does and, and it will take us out of our comfort zone. We'll be challenged in our lives if we're going to really pursue a vision from God. We'll be challenged to move past the same old, same old, the way we've been living. And we'll be led to attempt what might appear, at least to us at first, to be totally impossible. The theme of the opening pages of the book of Nehemiah, when God places that vision upon Nehemiah's heart, is, and his, his vision was to rebuild those demolished walls of Jerusalem. But the theme is focusing around this. And the city had laid in ruin for decades. And that task of rebuilding the walls seemed impossible. No one had been able to do it yet. Perhaps there have been others who um, felt a burden for that, but had never uh, gone to the point of actually doing something about it. But a God-given vision on the heart of a man who was simply a butler to the king, God chose him because he knew he could use him, and that would change everything. In spite of impossible odds and all those difficulties they're going to face and the continual opposition of the enemy, Amazing thing took place. The wall surrounding Jerusalem was rebuilt in 52 days. This is not with skilled, trained labor, necessarily. These are ordinary people, many of them having occupations completely different than would be associated with being able to build a wall. Led by a man who was the king's cupbearer or the king's butler. All those factors and the enemy continually trying to stop them and to intimidate them. All those factors considered God blessed in such a way the walls were completed in 52 days. Here's the scriptural uh, uh, report on that in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 20, uh, 25th day of Elu in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it. And all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived, I love this statement, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. So the enemies surrounding Jerusalem, and they, remember they'd been mocking the efforts of Nehemiah and, and making fun of what they were trying to do. When they saw the walls were finally completed, they were shocked, they were frightened because they realized now the strength that, that city would have. And they were even humiliated because the walls had been completed in just 52 days, an impossible task. And they knew, they knew this had to be the hand 
of the, of the God of Israel, therefore showing his favor upon the Jewish people. Well, this ancient wall that was really built now centuries ago, maybe to many may not seem to be that important, but I'm convinced we can learn some tremendous, some invaluable principles from the study of this. And that's what we're doing today. Throughout the centuries, God has continually placed burdens or visions upon the hearts of his people upon men and women to accomplish great and mighty things for him. And he still does this today. He's still doing this in the present. And our prayer is that he will lay that, ver- that vision upon each of our hearts as well. In fact, there's probably never been a time in history when we have so many opportunities uh, for God to work in amazing ways. Sometimes we look at these things that we're facing and the direction our world is going, and we, we want to throw up our hands in despair and say, oh my goodness, everything is falling apart. But if you look at it this way, that gives us an opportunity to do and to be used of God to do things that are totally impossible because it is God's doing them, not us. The question is, are we willing to catch the vision? Are we willing to step out by faith? Are we willing to do the work that God has for us? Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about men and women who have had the vision. I've used different examples, some from history, some from the scripture. And um, we've talked about them. But today, I want us to take that to the next step and to apply it to each of us personally. And realize this, if you are a child of God, you've already been commissioned. Now, as far as a specific task that God may have for you, we can we understand that Him laying that particular vision upon our hearts. But we're already called to this, so there, we should anticipate that He has, obviously, something for us to do. And the job might seem impossible and overwhelming. It may seem like the opposition is more powerful than we are. But never forget the power of God and the authority of God's Word in which we can accomplish whatever it is He has us to do. We simply need to unleash the vision. I want us to refer to this, and I, I think of a gentleman by the name of D.L. Moody, who um, was a, a great evangelist uh, back in the 1800s. It was said that he was able to lead a million souls to Christ. Uh, tremendously powerful in his preaching and a, just a, a burden to, to win souls, to point them to Jesus. He made this statement one time. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. By God's help, I aim to be that man. You see, he understood the idea of vision. And, and starting from a general perspective, he looked at it in the point of saying, I want to be the one that God can use. And here's the promise that God has given us concerning uh, the re- unleashing of the vision. We actually began our time together today with this verse. It is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. I want to remind you of it. God's word says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What vision has God placed on your life? Child of God, there is something that God wants you to do. We already have the commission. We know, we know that we're to uh, take the gospel to the four corners of the world. But what part do we have as individuals? What is it? And I guarantee you, God has something for you to do. What vision is God leading us as a church here at First Baptist to pursue? Maybe you're involved in a church someplace else. What vision does your church have that it should be pursuing? And that's what the question I want us to ask ourselves today. We can see that vision that God places upon our heart unleashed. It It can come to pass because of what God has promised us. As we are reminded in the book of Ephesians, first of all, God is able to do the unimaginable. If you read this verse, it, it seems like Paul is, is kind of struggling to find the words to express what he wants to say. The problem he's trying to describe, what he's trying to describe is indescribable in reality. Another translation uh, says this, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And the truth is, God's power far exceeds anything we could even imagine. Why would we even question 
his ability to accomplish anything. If there's something God has laid upon our heart, why would we ever say, well, yeah, that's a great idea, but there's no way it can take place. Who do we serve? Who is our God? We need to realize that. Do we really believe? Do we really believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think? I mean, we love this verse. This is a favorite verse among many believers, and we like the sound of it. But do we really believe it? Do we really live like we believe it to be true? Do we put God to the test in that sense? Are we willing to step out by faith and to attempt those things that look impossible, but relying upon God, go ahead and do them anyway? Are we willing to play to step out by faith, to stretch our faith, or do we have a tendency to play it safe? If we're being entirely honest, most of us are going to have to admit that we have a tendency to limit God according to our own understanding. Here's a, a, um, something that needs to be done, something we'd love to see done, perhaps a vision from God, it's something God's placed upon a heart. But we look at that and we say, well, well, that, that takes too, much, uh, too many finances here, or we don't have the resources, or I don't have the ability to do that, or uh, the church would never accept that, or whatever. And we begin to limit God according to our understanding. But let me remind you of something. God specializes. He specializes in things that are thought by everybody else to be impossible. He will do and to bring honor and glory to himself. He will do things that no one else could ever do. And we get to be the, uh, on the receiving end of that. We, we have the privilege of being those instruments that God uses to accomplish these things. One of the amazing attributes of God is what we call omnipotence. That is the fact that he's all-powerful. In other words, nothing's too hard for God. The scripture illustrates this over and over. It's a clear, uh, clearly taught from the scripture. But I think one very important example is found in Genesis chapter 17, verse number 1. Uh, most of you are familiar with the story. God had promised Abraham and Sarah a son. But at this point in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham is 99 years old and Sarah is 90. And that promised son has not been born. When God is ready to announce to Abraham that he's about to give him that long-awaited promise, this is how he introduces himself. This is found in Genesis chapter 17, verse number 1. Abra, when Abram, his name it will be changed shortly to Abraham, but at this point he's still known as Abram. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. The name that God uses for himself when he appears before Abraham at this time is really significant. I think it's very important. El Shaddai means, as it's translated there, God Almighty. But the implication of the word, and as we look at where, it's, where it has been derived from, it is the implication is really God is the Almighty, all-sufficient one. This, by the way, this passage, Genesis 17, verse 1, is the first place that this term is used in the Bible. It's used several other places, but this is the first place we find it. When God uh, introduces himself to Abraham as the all-sufficient, the almighty one, as he announces the fact that that baby will be born. It reminds us, this name reminds us of the fact that God is all-sufficient to care for us. Sometimes we don't make a connection between being all-powerful and all-sufficient, and it seems to be an easy connection, but I think sometimes we miss that. God can minister to every area of our lives. He's sufficient for that. Whether it's our physical life, you have physical needs, God is able to take care of those needs and to help you through those things, whether it's a spiritual need, emotional, intellectual, whatever it might be. I don't know how many times... Uh, continually, I, I need to ask God for wisdom and direction and um, for strength in the emotional realms and all these things. Those are things that God specializes in. He is there for us. He's completely capable and powerful. El Shaddai, the God who can do anything he wants to do, even if it means he must rejuvenate a dead womb and give babies to couples who are in their 90s. Hey, that's impossible. But yet God, with God, nothing is impossible. He's almighty and he's powerful. And after God introduced himself as El Shaddai in Genesis 17, 1, 
he then makes the promise of the long-awaited son. At this point, and I don't blame her, uh, 90-year-old Sarah laughed. But here's God's response to her. Genesis 18, verses 13 and 14. Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Well, you and I are thinking, well, we know why. She's, she's too old to have a child. Of course, she, it, was, it was humorous. It was, it was funny to her to think that she would have a baby. But the question is this. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, I mean, Sarah is noted for her great faith. I mean, she struggled a little bit there, but she's, her life is referred to in Hebrews chapter 11 as being a woman of great, awesome faith. And many times we're, we're saying, you know what, I really believe God. I believe His Word. I'm trusting in Him. But we laugh at the promises that God has because they seem impossible. We need to learn something, as Sarah and Abraham had to learn. They learned that nothing was too hard for God. The New Testament records this in uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 19 to 21, about their faith. It said, but, and Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he will be 100 by the time the baby is born. But at about 100 years of age, he figured his body as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever He promises. You want to underline something, highlight something, uh, keep it in some way, put it on a note card and, and have it where you can see that. that's a tremendous statement. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever He promises. The God that Abraham served, the same God you and I serve, He is totally able and willing and has promised to do whatever He's promised us. The fact that God can and He does do far more than we can ever imagine, that, that truth is found throughout the Scripture. Just remind the Gospel message, the fact that uh, God became man. That's impossible, and yet God brought it to pass. The fact that He was born of a virgin, that He lived a sinless life, that He performed these countless miracles, that He died a substitutionary death for us on the cross, and then that He rose again. Those things are, go well beyond what we could ever imagine. Why do we think then that He cannot do what we need in our lives today? Our whole belief in who God is is based on the unimaginable. It's all, this is the basis. He's a God of impossible things. God is able no matter what it is that we're facing, no matter what it is He's called us to do, God is able to perform those things. And then the passage you read in Ephesians also reminds us this, that God is at work in His people. That power that God has is really according to the power that works in us. So He's working through us. The Holy Spirit is empowering us to do what we need to do. The God of power is the same God who's at work in His people. And Paul is actually saying here that our own experience of God's power, that what we have experienced in our life, demonstrates that He is more than we could ever ask and able to do more than we could ever ask or even imagine. Think about what God had done for Paul. You know, Paul often would refer to his testimony. He began in his career, you might say, as a, uh, against the Christians, as a Christian hater. He was on his way to uh, put Christian, uh, Christians into prison when he met Jesus, and his whole life changed completely. Paul, I'm sure, often thought about the great miracle that God had brought in his life. Think yourself personally. Think about what God has done in your life. And maybe some of you have a testimony of knowing that God has just completely changed you 180 degrees from where you were headed. Maybe you were raised in a Christian home and you didn't experience the, the dregs of sin, but we understand and, and we realize that we're sinners that needed a Savior. And just what God has done and His forgiveness and His compassion towards us and our lives, God's done great and mighty things. God has provided needs for us in many cases. In my own life, personally, my wife and I especially can share so many ways that God has miraculously provided for us. 
uh, giving us a family and, and providing for us in, in so many ways is just beyond imagination. And that's exactly what the scripture describes. Have you experienced God's power and the fact of having new life in Christ? If you're a follower of Christ, it has taken place. The life-changing power of the gospel, that is perhaps one of the greatest examples. It's definitely an example of God's mighty power. If you're a child of God, the fact the Holy God would forgive you of your sin and welcome you to your, His family, that's a miracle beyond our comprehension, anything we could imagine. And here's something, because there are many today that they somehow have the idea, well, uh, to be a Christian or to have my sins forgiven or to go to heaven implies, oh yeah, I should believe those basic things about God, but man, I've got to work for it and somehow uh, deserve it. And at the end of life, I have done enough things to deserve God's, uh, God's gift and that He'd allow me to heaven. You know, when you have that thought process, you're insulting a holy God. God doesn't need our help. Now, it is true that when God saves us, He changes us, and our whole lives are different. But we don't make it into heaven because of the things that we stopped doing or started doing or the good works that we accomplished. The only way we get to heaven is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, shed to take away our sins and the simple fact that we put our faith in what Jesus did for us. The scripture tells us this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, dead if someone's dead, they are totally unable to respond, uh, to do anything to, to make a difference in their life. And that's where we were. We were totally unable to do anything to save ourselves. In, that, in the midst of that, we're dead in our sins. He gave us life when He raised up Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace, the word grace means unmerited favor, it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. We are saved from our sins not because we turned over a new leaf, not because we started doing uh, good things. Uh, it's because of God's grace and only because of His grace. So the Christian life begins with the power of God. And it continues through our life because of the power of God. We continually will have victory over sin, not because we're strong enough, but because of the power of God. And it eventually takes us to eternity to be with Him forever. That's through the power of God. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Salvation begins with God and it ends with God. All we do, we're along for the ride in that sense. It's just that uh, by faith, believing what Christ has done for us. But salvation is from God. Since God has the power to save us and to keep us saved, we can be sure he has the power to provide everything else we need in our lives. That's what we're trying to remind ourselves of today. The, this promise, though, is only to the child of God. I cannot make that promise to everyone who's listening if you're not a child of God, if you've never put your faith and trust in Him. Or I can tell you that God loves you and He invites you to trust Him to be uh, your Savior. But I cannot promise you that God is going to uh, take care of all these issues in your lives. Um, God's a gracious God. We call this common grace. There are many things that God gives people and provides for people totally outside of Christ. But the truth is the promises we're looking at here, and especially the promise of eternal life, is only to those who put their faith and trust in Him. And here's the thing. If every time we experience this, it brings glory to God, not to us. And we ought to be careful to give God the glory. God will receive the glory. In the verse we read a moment ago, it says, To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. What does it mean to be, uh, to be glory in the church? Well, remember, the church is not a building. It's not a denomination. The church is made up of those who have been born again by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. God is exalted when a local body of believers honor Him through faith and obedience. And when a church, uh, 
works towards the vision that it has to reach its community and uh, perhaps uh, focusing on, on worldwide missions or uh, doing specific things to reach people with the gospel, the things that God has laid on their on the hearts of the people. That, that does bring glory to God. But this statement we're looking at really uh, encompasses all of those who put their faith in Christ. The scripture says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. That's how these things bring glory to God. God is pointing towards that. This is what he has done. Every time a lost person comes to Christ, God is glorified. Think about that. Every time a lost sinner realizes that they're separated from God, they cannot save themselves, and they cry out to God in, um, in repentance and trust him, and through faith are saved. That brings glory to God. Every time as believers that we experience victory over sin, when there are temptations that we're able to get past because of the power of God, and, and when we, we see these things take place in our life, that brings glory to God. Every time we share what God has done for us. At First Baptist, we have begin every service with a time of praise, in, in which people and many times are talk about how awesome God had been to them and maybe some specific thing that took place. That brings glory to God. And we ought to do that in our lives continually. God's done something great for you. Go tell others what he's done. And he's a great and awesome God. And others often need that encouragement to realize that God does take care of his people. Throughout eternity, God can point to us, to you and me as his children, as trophies of his grace. So our lives will bring glory to him as we put our faith and trust in him. Therefore, we can represent the King of kings and Lord of lords in this life. We have that privilege to do so. We can experience answers to prayer. We can experience victories over sin. We can experience things that go far beyond what we could ever ask, think, imagine in any way. We can experience that because not of our power, not of our ability, but because of the power of God. In other words, we can unleash the vision God has given us because of His mighty power. And I hope you take this to heart today. All of us need to continue to experience God working through our lives. Let me ask you the question. Do you know Christ as personal Savior? Do, if you were to leave this life today, if you were to die today, do you know that you would go to heaven? I know many times people have this, this hopeful idea, think, well, I, I think I'm okay. I've not been that bad. I've known people a lot worse than me. But do you really have an absolute assurance that heaven will be your home? Really, the only way we can have that assurance is by knowing Christ as our Savior, knowing that we have put our faith and trust in Him. We're trusting Him and Him alone to save us, not the things that we do and not the, the efforts that we put in, but what He has already done for us. If you never have come to that point in your life, I'm, I really prayerfully ask you to think of that that need that you have. And that I pray today that you would put your faith and trust in Him once and for all. Cry out to Him and ask for forgiveness of sin. Invite Him into your life. Turn your life over to Him. As believers, we will face things in our life uh, continually. And we will have opportunities to... Uh, and be part of the vision, this vision that God has for us. But the only way we're going to accomplish those things is through His power. Unleash the power that God has placed within you. Unleash that vision. Let Him work in your heart. Well, thank you for being with us today. And I pray this to be a, a great week, an awesome week. We encourage you to join us. We uh, continue at this point to have our online Bible study on Wednesday night. It's at uh, 7 o'clock, and so we invite you to join us as we talk about discerning truth. I think it's a very important study. So on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and of course next Sunday, uh, we once again look forward to seeing you at 9.30, online service, also in-person service. If you are in Berlin, uh, able to be with us, we'd love to have you 
uh, with us in person, 930 uh, First Baptist Church is located at 15 North Main Street in Berlin. So have a great and awesome week and may God bless you.